Well, good morning. So the first question Larry asked was a question about God, who is God. So last week we talked about God is love. Today we get to talk about God is just. Trevor, you're saying, can't we do another sermon on God is love? We prefer that one a little bit more. Um, but if we're honest, we have to admit that we actually do kind of like justice when it's our way anyway. You know, when you see that wild driver weaving through traffic, speeding, putting other people in danger. And then about two miles later, you see they've been pulled over by a police officer. You just kind of like, well, I kind of like justice in those moments. Those of us who are baseball fans, we don't mind when the Yankees overspend to pilfer other teams of their star athletes and then the Yankees have a losing season or the Yankees don't make the playoffs. You know, it's kind of like, well, that's justice. This year, of course, they made the playoffs and so we just root for them to lose. <laughs> we all like justice when it's our way and we need, ju- we need God to be just. In our, in our hearts, there's something about us that knows that's true. Psalm 106, 103.6 says, um, the Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed, people who are oppressed by those in power with no sense of being able to respond to, boy, you want a God who sees all and can do justice. God's justice means that he's good, that he's reliable. Deuteronomy 32 verse four says, the rock, his work is perfect. Now, as I was reading that, I thought, you know what you find if you Google The Rock? Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne Johnson, that's right. Yeah, and so I thought, I'm going to read this. And people are going to think, Dwayne Johnson. No. <laughs> um, uh, all of God's ways are just a faithful God without bias. He is righteous and true. A.W. Tozer, an old preacher, said, Justice is indistinguishable from righteousness. It means uprightness or rectitude. Justice is not something God has. Justice is something God is. Justice flows from God because that is his nature. So today I want for us to look at um, probably the quintessential example of the justice of God found in the Old Testament. And that's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if children grow up in Christian homes today, they know the story of Noah and the ark, Noah's flood. If you were a Hebrew child growing up in older times, your story would have been the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was just part of the fabric of the Hebrew nation. They knew this story. I mean, if there was a story that is like, this is God's justice. It was this. For instance, the Old Testament prophets, when they would look for an example of God's justice to warn people, take God seriously, they would say, Sodom and Gomorrah. When Jesus was teaching, there were times that he would say, he warn people of judgment to come. And he would, if he was talking about wickedness, he would say things like, it is going to be, it is going to be better for the city, on judgment day for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah than for, you know, Capernaum and people's jaws would drop and like, you mean there's, there are people that are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah? And so it's something that we take seriously. Um, and so I want you to see this, uh, and, but I want you to see also, um, one of the classic mistakes that people make in interpreting the Bible is that you'll hear sometimes people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of justice, but the God of the New Testament is a God of grace. And sometimes I think, what Bible are you reading? The old, even in this story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, what we're going to see is the love of God, the mercy of God. By the way, I was talking between services with Patrick Dennis. And Patrick Dennis, he said, you know what's ironic to me about, what's odd to me about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? He said, what, is people, what are people's number one, one, number one reason they get frustrated with God? Why doesn't God punish evil? Why doesn't God stop evil? And then when God stops evil in Sodom and Gomorrah, they're kind of like, oh, that's a bad thing. So it's like, we want God to stop evil. We just want him to stop the evil that we think is evil, not the evil that we think is okay. Anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to us today. We know that you want to, that you will. Your word is living and active. 
we do invite your presence through Christ we pray. Amen. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. So we see in the beginning, we see in this story, God's justice is just filled with so much patience. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah, in some ways, is the story of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. Abraham is the father of the faithful, the father of the children of Abraham. Lot is his nephew. And the, one of the first things we learn about Lot is that he's wealthy. Oh, by the way, by the time you get to know Lot after a while, Lot, seeing Lot's name in the Bible is kind of like seeing a drip coming from your ceiling. You ever had that experience? <laughs> You know it means there's trouble. There's a lot more trouble than you see. There's a lot more. Every time you see Lot, you think, oh, I wonder what trouble we're going to get into next. Well, Lot is wealthy because Abraham is wealthy. And there comes a point where their herds become so large that their herdsmen begin to bicker. And so Abraham calls Lot to him and says, let's not fuss with each other. Let's not argue about land. There's plenty of land. And Abraham does this incredibly humble thing. He says to Lot, you can either have the plain of the Jordan, fertile plain of the Jordan, or you can have the hill countries of Canaan to the west, but it's your choice. That's humble because Abraham doesn't have to give him the choice. Abraham could have made the choice himself. He had that power. Now, which would you choose? The Bible says in verse 10, Lot looked and he saw the entire plain of the Jordan was well watered everywhere like the Lord's garden in the land of Egypt. This is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the entire plain of the Jordan for himself. The indication there is it was a selfish choice. He should have deferred to his uncle. What would you choose? Young people? There are two cookies, one large, one small. Which do you take? Your family is going through the meal buffet style what do you do? Do you make sure you're the first to go through, want to go through in front of everybody else, or do you defer to others? When you come here on Sunday morning, do you fight for the best seats, or do you sit in the front where nobody wants to sit? The humble, <laughs> the danger seats there, yeah. So, a lot makes a selfish choice, and by the way, I really don't care where you sit. I don't think there's a selfish seat here. I'm glad you're here. Um, but he made the selfish choice for himself. Verse 12, Lot lived in the cities on the plain and set up his tent near Sodom. Now, the men of Sodom were evil, sinning immensely against the Lord. At this point, we just kind of want to say, oh, Lot, don't go there. Don't go there. See, Lot knew he was moving toward ungodliness. But I'm sure he reasoned. I can live near Sodom and Sodom's not going to affect me. It's not going to entice me. One of my mentors um, throughout my life, as long as she, she was alive, was Roseanne Russell. And when I was going to college, Roseanne said to me, Brett, don't let anybody spoil you with sin. Lot let Sodom spoil him with sin. Living near Sodom, his spiritual sensitivities are dulled. It captures the heart of his wife and daughters. He develops a tolerance for their sins. He has to do business there in Lodham. He becomes friends with people in Lodham. He starts to reason, yeah, I know that they're sinning immensely against the Lord, but they're still really good people. They do really nice things. I just want to be their friends. And after all, if they're honest, they enjoy the cultural activities, the advantages, the advances of, of technology, in a sense, in Sodom. Verse 14 tells us that when the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, when those cities were uh, overtaken in a war, Lot and his family were taken with them. Lot also, they also took Abram's uh, nephew, Lot, and his possessions. You expect to say and his wife and daughters, but no, the picture that we have of Lot is his greed at this point. You know, it's Lot in his possessions, we notice. Why? Because he was living in Sodom. He's now living in Sodom. At first he was looking toward Sodom, and then he had his tent near Sodom. Now he's living in Sodom. F.B. Meyer says, Nobody, no man suddenly becomes base. 
Few people run away from God in rebellion immediately. Usually we just drift. We start attending worship a little less frequently. We don't serve quite as much. And then we don't serve at all because we're really busy. We have other things to do. Next thing you know, you've wandered away. When I was a kid, I I remember uh, playing in the summer. Maybe you all had this experience too. And I would go into the basement to get something to drink. And at first, the darkness kind of hurt my eyes. I had to strain. But it didn't take long before my eyes adjusted to the darkness. And then when it came time to go back outside and play again, I'd open that basement door and I'd run outside and the bright sun of the afternoon would hurt my eyes. Sin can seem very dark at first until our eyes adjust. And then suddenly it's the light of Jesus that makes us uncomfortable. Lot's family has adjusted to the darkness. His daughters dated Sodom's sons. They learned Sodom's values, enjoyed Sodom's esteem, tolerated Sodom's morals. Until the point that we're going to find out that Lot's wife just could not imagine living without Sodom. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God is patient with you, not wanting anybody to perish, but everybody to come to repentance. God could have zapped Sodom and his family, or Sodom, uh, Lot and his family at this point, but he, he's so patient with them, wanting them to come to repentance. Anybody here wandering towards Sodom, allowing your eyes to adjust to the darkness of Sodom? This is a difficult time to live as Christians and to keep our eyes attuned to the light. There's a lot of pressure for you to adjust to the darkness. And you start to criticize the light. And you start to get concerned that you might be too associated with the light. Maybe you find yourself avoiding those associations. Thomas Jefferson um, was talking about slavery when he said, I tremble to think that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. And because the United States didn't repent in those early years, there was a time when God's justice did not sleep and we we fought a horrible civil war. Hundreds of thousands of lives were lost and we still pay the penalty today. God is patient in his justice, calling us now to come home. We also see God's patience in his warnings that justice is coming. Verse 20, then the Lord said the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense and their sin is extremely serious. The sin always, there are many sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. The sin that is primarily associated with them, of course, is homosexuality, um, sodomy. Now, there are people today who will say, oh, no, in the book of Ezekiel, you know, Ezekiel says that it talks about how they were inhospitable. You know, okay, so God completely destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because they, you know, didn't offer people food. I, I, um, no, they were inhospitable. Actually, if you look at that list, if you read the context, the context is assuming that people understand the prevalent sins of Sodom. But even though God is patient, he says, okay, enough is enough. Enough people have been hurt. Enough damage has been done. Enough children and marriages have been destroyed. And he goes to Abraham and he warns him about destroy the city. Abraham knows that Lot's family is there and is in danger, and so he begins to negotiate with God. God is so patient. He says, God, you are not, that you are a righteous God. You certainly will not punish the righteous with the unrighteous, will you? So if there are 50 righteous people, certainly you won't destroy the city. If there are 50 righteous people, says God, God no, says, no I, I won't destroy the city if there are 50 righteous people. What about 45? I mean, certainly if there's a five-person difference, you're not going to destroy the city, are you? God says, no, I won't won't destroy the city if there's 45 righteous people. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know you never pay the asking price. There's always a negotiation for a lower price. 
Abraham right now is on a roll. You know, and so he keeps dickering with God. God is so patient with him until he gets him down to 10. God, if there's 10 righteous people, you certainly won't destroy the city if there are 10 righteous people, will you? Oh no, God says, I won't destroy the people if there are 10 righteous people. And at this point, Abraham thinks he's saved Sodom and Gomorrah. He figures there's Lot, Lot's wife, Lot's two daughters, their two boyfriends. Certainly there are four other righteous people. But what Lot doesn't... What, what, Abraham doesn't realize it that e, is that even Lot's family is not righteous. Not only are they living in Sodom, they have reached the point where Sodom has taken up residence in them. But again, God is so patient. He sends warnings to Lot himself. He sends a couple of angels. Verse 1 of chapter 19. Two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in Sodom's gateway. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed his face to the ground and he said, my lords, uh, these angels look like men. You know, the book of Hebrews talks about people entertaining angels unaware. They think this may may be a reference to this. But Lot realizes there's something about these men that's different. That's whole. And so he calls them, my Lord. He bows down before them. Turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet and spend the night. Then you can get up early and go on your way. Lot knows the wickedness of the people of Sodom and he knows what those people will do if they find out these men are in town. But they insist, no, we would rather spend the night in the city square. Just let us hang out on Main Street. And Lot knows that is not a good idea. Verse three, so he urged them so strongly that they followed him and went into the house. He prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread for them and they ate. Lot is sweating jelly beans. <laughs> uh, he knows what's going to happen if word gets out that these guys are there. He makes unleavened bread. That's what you make when you're in a hurry. You know, and, he's, and basically what he's just told them is, um, why don't you eat? We'll have a quick meal. Go to bed quickly and then leave in the morning as soon as you can. Kind of like, it's really good to see you. How soon can you get out of here? <laughs> Better to see you go. Up to this point, you know, we've seen God's justice being patient. Now we are going to see very clearly how God's justice is deserved. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population surrounded the house. They called out to Lot and said, where have the men who came to you, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us so that we can have sex with them. The prophet Jeremiah talks about people who have lost the capacity to blush. They just act in certain sins and they just don't feel any guilt, any conscience anymore. The people of Sodom have lost the capacity to blush. Hard to believe that people could accept that. It's just like the whole town. It's just this is to be expected. This is accepted. Hard to imagine. A hundred years ago, it would have been hard to imagine that, that people would actually campaign for the taking of innocent human life as a right. A hundred years ago, people would have thought that is unimaginable. 50 years ago, people would have thought, can't imagine people believing homosexuality should be, you know, that homosexual marriage should be legal today. If you disagree with it, you're seen as strange. Five or 10 years ago, people would have thought there'll never come a time when gender fluidity becomes normalized, when people are arguing about government funded transition surgeries. But now, today, increasingly, if you aren't pro transgender, then you're seen as the one who's got a problem. Have you ever heard of the Hemingway Law of Motion? In Hemingway's book, um, the, Sun also, the Sun Also Rises, he records this dialogue. Bill says to his friend, how did you go ra- bankrupt? Mike responds, two ways. Gradually at first, then suddenly. How do people go morally bankrupt? In the 20th century, we watched the United States go bankrupt morally 
gradually. In the last few years, we've been watching it go bankrupt rapidly. But it's not too late. Genesis 19.6 says, Then Lot went out to them at the entrance of his house and shut the door behind him. He said, Don't do this evil, my brothers. Second Timothy chapter, Second Peter chapter 2 says that Lot's righteous soul was tormented by the unrighteousness of Sodom. And yet look how corrupt his thinking became. Look, he said, I've got two daughters who haven't been intimate with a man. I'll bring them out to you and you can do whatever you want to them. However, don't do anything to these men because they have come under the protection of my roof. How in the world could Lot come to that place? He's trapped and he feels like the best option I have is to allow them to rape my virgin daughters. You know how it happened. You watched it happen. Gradually. He just made a little compromise after a little compromise after a little compromise until he finds himself now in a situation where he is trapped. A situation he didn't need to find himself in if he had repented sooner. Get out of the way, they say to him in verse 9. This one came here as an alien, but he's acting like a judge. Now we'll do more harm to you than to them. Who are you to judge us, they say? You know, you're an outsider here. Who do you think you are? I am sure that when Lot was younger, he was thinking, I can be friends with these people even though I don't accept their morals. I can get close to them and, 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 and I'll just, I don't want them to think that I'm intolerant. I don't want to lose their relationships. But then when he's forced to take a stand, he realizes they never really respected him in the first place. Why is it that immoral people can be so bold advocating their darkness? And yet we can be so timid. Is it because we're afraid to hear people say, oh, you're so judgmental? Is it because we're afraid to hear people say, you are the reason people don't go to church. You Christians are so judgmental. You're so intolerant. Verse 9. They put pressure on Lot and came up to break down the door. But the angels reached out and brought Lot into the house with them. I wish I could have seen that miracle. And he shut the door. They struck the men who were at the entrance of the house both young and old with blindness, so they were unable to find the entrance. See, by the way, notice Lot didn't have to offer his daughters to be raped. God is so gracious. Even though Lot doesn't deserve it, he was protecting. God was protecting Lot, verse 12. Then the angel said to Lot, do you have anyone here? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because of the outcry against its people is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. In other words, the outcries, the, another paraphrase says, the outcries of the victims of the sins here has reached the ears of God. And so he has sent us to completely blast this place into oblivion. Verse 14 so Lot went out and he spoke with his sons-in-laws who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said, get out of this place for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Two things just real quickly. There are some people that the idea of God ever judging makes them laugh. God is never gonna judge us. The other thing that I would point out is that Lot has worked so hard to fit into Sodom that when he finally is forced to take a stand and he says, okay, I can't go further than this, nobody takes him seriously. Verse 15, at daybreak, the angels urged Lot on, get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you'll be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated I read that prepared and I think, what? You know, why would Lot hesitate? He knows the city is going to be destroyed. He knows how wicked they are. He knows this place is inhospitable to him. They have told him, God has sent us here to. And so he's like, oh, but not quite yet. I'm not ready to leave quite 
Yeah, really? The next line is wonderful. Because of God's, because of the Lord's compassion for him, because of the Lord's compassion for him, God's justice is always mixed thoroughly with compassion. The men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, the hands of his two daughters, and they brought them out and left them outside of the city. They only had four hands, and they had to use each one of them to drag Lot's family to safety. Verse 17, as soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere on the plane. Run to the mountains or you'll be swept away. At this point, Lot says, you guys have my credibility. You are from God. I believe you. I'm going to follow you. You make lots of sense. No, he doesn't. He's, he whines. Oh, he says, please don't make us go up to the mountains. Well, we can't make it there. It's too hard. Verse 20. Look, this city, this town is close enough to flee to. It's a small place. Let's run to it so we can survive. Here, understand this. At the core of Lot's problem is he's wise in his own eyes. He thinks he's smarter than God or God's messengers or God's words. By the way, well, verse 24 says, and then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the Lord. He demolished these entire, these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the city and whatever grew on the ground. You might call that climate change. I read an article in Smithsonian Magazine as I was reading, preparing for this message that talked about how some scientists believe that they may have discovered the remains of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. John Bergsman, one of the scholars, said they found massive evidence that a huge heat blast from the sky incinerated two cities on the plain on the Jordanian side of the river. Principal archaeologist Stephen Collins said... It could very well be that there was an air blast from some massive asteroid explosion that blew uh, explosion the, with the power of the bomb that exploded over Hiroshima. The article went on to say, salt was thrown up due to the high impact pressures. It may be that the impact partially hit the Dead Sea, which is rich in salt. Now, I'm not sure how much to make of those observations. Um, there are lots of people that have, through the years, claimed, oh, we found Sodom and Gomorrah. And, you know, unless there's more evidence, I, I would take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> but I find it interesting still that there are scientists who say, you know, we can understand how this kind of thing actually could have happened. Verse 26, as they were fleeing, Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. This was not just a curious glance over the shoulder. The idea here is that she lingered behind Lot and she was fixated on the destruction. Despite the angel's gracious warning, don't look back, flee or you'll be destroyed with the cities. She didn't take God's warning seriously. She removed herself from underneath God's protection. It's really sad. But what I find interesting is in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 17, Jesus is warning people about judgment day to come at the end of time. And he refers to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Like I said, this is like the lesson in ancient times, Jewish people, Hebrew people on God's judgment. But when he remembers the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, I just find it fascinating. He just says three words. Remember Lot's wife. Of all the things that he could say, remember Lot's wife. She wanted to leave Sodom, but she wanted to go back. She wanted to leave Sodom, but she was torn. She wanted to leave Sodom, but her heart was still with Sodom And so she paid a terrible price. Remember Lot's wife. Am I talking to anybody today who you hear God calling you away from a Sodom and Gomorrah and yet you're torn? You want to follow Jesus with all your heart, but you don't. You really do believe that Jesus is Savior and Lord and the Bible is his word. But there's a part of Sodom and Gomorrah that you just want to fit in with. You just don't want to completely leave it behind. Remember Lot's wife. I wish 
isn't this a fun story? <sighs> I wish that was the worst part of the story. After Lot's wife dies, his daughters panic. Verse 31, they say, there's no man in the land to sleep with us. Let's get our father to drink wine so that we may sleep with him and preserve our father's line. This is the influence that Sodom has had on Lot's daughters. And so they got their father to drink that wine that night. And he did not know when she lay down or when she got up. Don't you suppose that Lot learned to enjoy drinking in Sodom? And out of those two awful relationships were born Moab, the father of the Moabites, and Ammi, the father of the Ammonites, two of the arch enemies of the people of Israel in years to come. Do you see what's happened with Lot? Lot begins in the story as a friend of Abraham, who's the friend of God, the father of faith, the father of the people of God. But the last we read of him in the book of Genesis, he's the father of of Abraham's enemies, the enemies of God's people. A.W. Tozer said, the wheels of God's justice grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. Now, there are several takeaways that we could have from this about the justice of God. I'm share with you just a few. The first one is, let's remember, God's justice means patience. God is just. It means that his right, he is right, his ways are right. And yet he's so patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but everybody to come to repentance. And so God sends warning after warning to repent. Do you hear God sending warning to you to repent? Any warnings you're hearing through a sermon or a song or a friend, through somebody else's experience, and the, you, you, you watch their lives and you see how sin led to death, and God is warning you, nudging you, Repent. Jesus said, unless uh, you all will likewise perish unless you repent. Early in the morning of December 7th, 1941, George E. Elliott was manning uh, radar equipment, state of the art SCR 270 at the tip of Oahu. He said he saw a blip on the screen. He reported it, but But the supervisor said, don't worry about it. It's probably not anything serious. We know today that it was over 180 Japanese planes on their way to attack Pearl Harbor. And today we wonder how many lives could have been saved if they would have listened to the warning. God is handing us warnings today. And the question, how many lives could be saved? Maybe even yours, maybe your family's if we heed his warnings. God sent Jonah to Nineveh. One of our favorite stories in the Bible, right? Nineveh, is, the Assyrians were about as wicked as the people that you can find. I mean, just look at how they treat people. They were awful. Talk about murderers. And so God sends Jonah to Nineveh, their capital, and calls them to repent. Repent or you're going to perish. And this strange thing happened. They actually repented. I mean, from the leaders all the way down to the cattle, apparently, and say they all repented and God spared them of the judgment to come. God is calling you and me to repentance. Nobody here is further gone than Nineveh. Our nation is not further gone than Nineveh. There is still time if we would be his people and repent. Hear the warnings. Stephen Brown tells of a Pan Am flight years ago at 20,000 feet. One of the the engines went out. By the way, Stephen Brown's a comedian. Uh, The pilot came on the intercom. He was very calm. He said, you may have noticed that the right engine went out, uh, but no need to worry. We still have the engine on the left wing and the rear engine on the, on the tail will be just fine. Not long after that, the engine on the left wing went out, came back on. If I may have your attention, please, you will notice that the engine on the left wing went out now, but that's okay. We'll be able to get there with the one engine remaining. It wasn't long after that that the engine on the tail began to sputter. He came back on. May I have your attention, please? 
Would those of you who can swim go to the right-hand side of the plane? Those of you who can't swim, go to the left-hand side of the plane. He gave him a couple of moments for the people to adjust to their new positions. He says, now to those of you on the right-hand side of the plane who can swim, when we ditch in the ocean in a few moments, it looks like we're going to swim like mad. If I could address those of you who are on the left-hand side of the plane, I want to thank you for flying Pan Am today. (laughs) There comes a time when it's too late. There was time for Sodom and Gomorrah. There was time for Lot and his family, but there was a, there came a time. And Jesus said, there will come a time when it's too late and nothing can be done, but the warning signs are clear today. The next thing, the, I don't have time to make the application today, but is, you know, God's justice means you're not forgotten, you who feel powerless and persecuted and oppressed. Another lesson, though, that we learn from this is even though God is just, righteousness can preserve a society. God would have spared the city if there were just 10 righteous people. Let that sink in. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Salt is a preservative agent that that keeps food from spoiling so it has to be thrown out. You're the salt of the earth. There have been many times I've wondered if the only reason God is preserving the United States is because there are still a few righteous people. Righteousness exalts a nation, the Bible says. The sin is a disgrace to many people. I'm going to talk about this more in another message, my next message. But um, we need to remember, no matter what happens as a result of this election... We have work to do. We need to remember, no matter what happens after this next election, we need to be the salt of the earth. We are called, God has called us to this generation and he will be with us. The final message though, the final lesson is my favorite. It really is a question, why in the world did God spare Lot? It wasn't because Lot was so good, is it? It's because Lot was in relationship with Abraham. Verse 27 says, early in the morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Remember the, the, the dickering relationship? And so it was when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he demolished the cities where Lot had lived. God saw Lot and he remembered Abraham. Parents, grandparents. Um, there have been more than one time in my life I've wondered in my sin, in my stupidity, if God protected me because he remembered my grandmother praying, my mother praying, my parents, grandparents praying for me. Parents, grandparents, pray for your kids. Pray for your grandkids. We don't know how God works, but I think sometimes God looks at our kids and grandkids and he remembers those who are praying for them. But I think the more important application to make here, of course, is that Abraham foreshadows Jesus Christ himself. Lot is not saved because of his own righteousness. He's saved because of the righteousness of Abraham. Abraham is righteous by faith. And therefore, when God looks at Abraham, he sees Lot. And the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God sent his son into this world who died on the cross so that we might be forgiven. And the Bible tells us that when we're baptized into Christ, we are clothed with Christ. That means when God sees us, after we've surrendered our life to Jesus Christ as Savior, when God looks at you, let this sink in, he doesn't see you in your rags of sin, he sees you in the pure white robes of Jesus Christ. Is that an amazing thing? And so if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I mean, I, I, you know, I hurt for you because you stand before God still in your own clothes and there's the guilt and the shame and the defeat in that. And Jesus has given his life for you so you can walk at peace with God so that when God sees you, 
He doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. And when you die and you stand before God, he'll look at you and he'll remember Jesus. And you'll be saved. He'll be welcomed home. God is just, but he's patient, not wanting anybody to perish, but everybody to come to repentance. What is God's justice and mercy? What does it say to you today? How is it calling you to next step to walk with him in his love and righteousness? Heavenly Father, I pray that you change us today. We thank you for the grace that we find through Jesus Christ. That um, although we have sinned, you have mercy and pardon. Um, That you didn't have to send your son into this world. You could have just zapped us. But you're so patient and loving and gracious. Lord, make us your people. And take us now into a world of people who are walking in their own rags of sin, who need Jesus. Through Christ we pray. Amen.